Okay, I'm going to um, uh, reintroduce Ben Broke Marco, the Executive Director of the Florida Historical Society, who will um, introduce our next speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the World of the Yearling Symposium. Uh, we have three more exciting speakers for you this afternoon. First up, <clears throat> excuse me, is Stephen Knoll. Uh, Stephen Knoll is a senior lecturer in the Department of History here at the University of Florida. Uh, the most recent of his three books is Ditch of Dreams, The Cross Florida Barge Canal, and the Struggle for Florida's Future with David Tegeter. Steve Knoll's research and teaching interests include Florida history and environmental history, both of which intersect here in his examination of Rawlings, the Yearling, and the Florida setting for that novel. His long-standing personal affinity for the Yearling and its connection to the land and people of Florida can best be seen in the name he and his wife gave to their son, Jody Baxter Knoll. So I, I think he yeah, wins first place for uh, being a fan of the Yearling here. Please welcome Stephen Knoll. Thanks. It does help that my wife's maiden name is Baxter, so that made it a little easier to, to think about that. But I'd um, um, like to thank my students for, for showing up here. I'd like to thank everybody else for coming on this um, interestingly bizarre Florida winter day. So um, thanks. Welcome. Um, hopefully the after lunch, first after lunch, won't lead to lots of uh, snoring in the back row. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll jazz it up a bit. Um, my ta uh, talk is titled Steamboats and Subsistence. The ever-changing, ever-static world of the St. John's Oklahoma Basin. And um, when uh, Flo Turcott asked me to participate in this, um, she kind of gave me this broad-ended, open-ended thing to say, talk about something. Talk about rivers. Talk about rivers and Rawlings. Um, and I like alliteration, so rivers and Rawlings and um, steamboats and subsistence really work well together. So I, you know, for me, the interesting thing about what I'm talking about and how it ties into um, the, the stuff that we talked about this morning, um, particularly Connie Lester's, is this notion of subsistence and, and the subsistence nature of, of uh, Baxter's Island and the, the hardscrabble life that um, the Florida crackers lived, um, particularly in that um, wilderness area called the Great Scrub. Um, and combine that simultaneously to the, the um, growing kind of, of market-based notions of Florida in the 1870s as exemplified by the steamboats coming into, into this region. And certainly uh, the area in which the Great Scrub exists between the Akawaha on the, on the west and the St. John's on the east is the area that is most penetrated by the steamboat traffic in the late um, decades of the 19th century. So it's kind of interesting. On the one hand, we have these people living this subsistence life off the land, while at the other time, this is the major area in which Florida is being modernized, if we can use that verb, um, during the same time period. So this is Florida, and uh, it's not your eyes. This is a rather um, picture that is not very clear. This is Florida at this time period. And we're looking at the area right in kind of east central Florida in which both the yearling takes place and in which uh, the steamboat era takes place. And, you know, steamboats obviously um, have to be involved on riverine traffic, and the major rivers in Florida are the St. John's, the Suwannee, which is not necessarily appropriate for steamboat traffic, and out on the, the panhandle up here in the white is, is the Apalachicola. But the major one then is the St. John's, which provides access to both the market and to bringing goods to market um, for people like uh, the Foresters and the Baxters who live in what is now the Ocala National Forest. This is the St. John's River. Um, Important that it goes and drains the area of central Florida, which allows for penetration of steamboats, but also its connection to the Atlantic Ocean through Jacksonville. And um, the interesting thing is that connection to Jacksonville is only made possible by its relationship to the federal government, because Jacksonville's harbor is inland. All this part of the St. John's has to be dredged. Dredging is expensive, dredging is problematical, so at a time period in the 1870s, right after Reconstruction, when Floridians, uh, white Floridians return to power, they're angry at the federal government. They don't like the federal government, except the federal government can provide the funding necessary for them to uh, dredge their harbor. And in kind of one of the more interesting um, paradoxes, 
the general in charge of dredging out for the Army Corps of Engineers, dredging out um, Jacksonville's harbor and making it accessible to. It's a, it's a truck outside. Man, if that happened in my class, I'd be screaming out the window. Um, um, the, the general in charge of dredging that out for the Army Corps of Engineers is none other than Quincy Gilmore. Um, anybody know who Quincy Gilmore is? Ah, we don't have Florida historians here. Quincy Gilmore is the Union commander at the Battle of Olusti. So, um, you know, here, here's a guy who, who, on the one hand, comes down here and uh, is involved in taking back the state for the federal government and, you know, less than 20 years later is involved in rebuilding the state. So uh, lots of that kind of, of interesting juxtapositions in this time period in Florida as white Southerners want to build up their state and have to utilize the capital that is only accessible from Northerners, often Northerners who had connections to uh, Union Army and the Republican Party. This is uh, the area in green of the Ocala National Forest of the Big Scrub, drained, as we said, on the east side by um, the St. Johns River and Lake George, which is not really a lake, but it's a widening of the river. Um, and kind of like Lake, Lake Monroe, widening of the river down here near Sanford. And, and if you want a great book on the St. Johns and its relationship to that, Bill Belleville's River of Lakes defines this river in, in those terms. And on the west side, the Ocklawaha River, which flows um, from the chain of lakes in, in central Florida around where Leesburg is today, up here, and as, as we heard this morning, flows north and then flows eastward and comes into the, the St. Johns uh, just south of Palatka, right across the river from a, a small town called Wallaca. So this is the area in which pioneer families come to Florida, subsistence pioneer families. And, and as we heard from, from Ann's uh, talk this morning, you know, people coming here with their oxen, um, hard scrabble, families, large families, which again points out the problems in the yearling with Jody Baxter as, as, a, as a only child. Um, you know, coming down here looking for a better life, looking for opportunity, which certainly defines Florida in, in all its permutations. You know, People coming from other places looking for opportunity, whether it's opportunity on the rivers, whether it's opportunity to find a better subsistence lifestyle away from other people, this is what defines Florida. And certainly even today, you know, I, on Tuesday I gave a talk at, at the Lemon Bay Festival down in, in Englewood um, about Florida environmental history, and I said, okay, let's talk about people coming in here. How many people were born in Florida? And not one, of the, not one in either of the two talks answered that question. So how many people here were born in Florida? Good, better. And not just, not just kids, but old people as well. Older people, not old people. The only old person who's talking is me, so, so that's good. But, um, and it's not just white families involved in subsistence. Um, African-American families newly freed uh, from slavery, um, their goal at some point <clears throat> is to live that independent life, because you know, their whole life they have been dependent. To live that independent life means to live the life as, of a subsistence farmer. So you know, one thing that the yearling really doesn't mention is the kind of racialized dimension of, of farm life in Florida in the 1870s as hundreds of, of freedmen attempt to break the bonds that they had under slavery and develop an independent lifestyle. You know, it may not be something where they get lots of money, but certainly it's something where they don't have to have any relationship to those people who they were dependent on uh, before the Civil War. Um, this is a cabin, very similar to the ones that, that the, the Baxters may have had in um, the Yearling. This is in the, along the Ocklawaha River, and an example, certainly not even planed, okay? You know, we got the wood just taken from the trees. Um, certainly, as Connie Lester talked this morning, um, we have this gender division of labor and women involved in making um, their own clothing and particularly quilts. This is a loom from um, Dudley Farm, which is the, the um, farmhouse uh, owned by and operated by the Florida Park Service just west of here on Newberry Road, which really, um, even more so than the yearling household, really shows what life was like um, on the frontier for um, families in Florida from the 1870s into the 1930s. Um, and this is a wagon shed. Um, the wagons often used mostly for going to town, which shows that uh, 
maybe these people are not as necessarily as self-sufficient subsistence farmers as possible. And I think that that's really important to understand. In spite of the fact that they are living by themselves, their relationship to that ethereal thing, that thing that's somewhere. Anybody know what that somewhere thing is? The market, okay? The market, okay? And the market is there, okay? The market is there. And even a family as self-sufficient as the Baxters have to rely on the market for certain things. And we'll talk about how the steamboats kind of impinge that market upon that lifestyle. And getting to market, you have that, that buckboard, that wagon, okay? Um, also, you have, this again is taken from Dudley Farm. Um, if you need to have um, syrup, we have this syrup making stuff that you can, that, that you can uh, have at your, at your farm. Um, this syrup making is produced by mules, often in uh, late December, uh, early January. And um, I'm not sure, I don't think the Baxters had that, but certainly an important part of a subsistence lifestyle along the, in the Great Scrub. This is, anybody know who, what this is? This is the cabin for the yearling movie, okay? This is um, the one that was built for the movie. This is the one in which they live. So very, um, appropriate representation of what life was like for a family like the Baxters, like the Longs, in 1870s Florida. Florida. Same thing, same thing again. You can see the yard, you can see the pen, um, all sorts of stuff. So um, very, and you can see, you know, even though they live in the scrub, this harsh, unforgiving land, you know, they are living in what is called um, a hammock, um, an island. Um, in this case, it's called, it's called, um, Baxter's Island, and you know, the scrub and the foliage is much different than it is in the unforgiving scrub that surrounds them. So um, this provides protection, it provides sol um, solitude, and it makes it a very difficult lifestyle. You know, you can see, not a very forgiving place for families uh, to raise their next generation. But alongside this unforgiving land is the beautiful, subtropical, wonderful Ocklawaha River, which provides the first avenue of commerce and tourism in 1870s Florida. And if you want to think of Disney World circa 1875, you got it right here, okay? People come to Florida to see the subtropical environment. And white people come to Florida, wealthy northerners. Wealthy northerners just beginning to feel the effects of industrialization, of urbanization, looking for some retreat back to the natural world. And at this point, Florida is the natural world. Very different, very, according to the, the strange notions of these, very African, you know, the, this, as far as I know, this doesn't look very much like Africa, but um, the assumptions are, you know, if it's different, if it's strange, it's gotta be Africa, so, you know. We don't want to go to Africa. We don't want to spend all our time and money to go there. We can just go to we can just go to Central Florida. In order to do that, we have to have we have to have money, and we have to have entrepreneurial vision, both of which are supplied by northern entrepreneurs. People like Colonel Hubbard Hart. Is he a colonel? Nah. He just takes that name because it makes him sound important. Okay. And Hubbard Hart is from Vermont. Comes to Florida in the 1850s. Starts a stagecoach line. Runs guns and, and cotton uh, as a blockade runner for the Confederates during the war. Then after the war, um, comes back and opens up a steamboat operation on the Ocklawaha River. Um, and this is, you know, this tells you how precarious. how precarious this is. This is a letter he's writing in 1885. Um, I think I can sell this for $20,000, and I better do it, because you can't get more than 15 after the railroad gets to running, okay? So pretty early, you know, these steamboats are under competition from the railroad, which will come in the 1880s and 1890s by, and my class knows this, all those Henrys, and that William Chipley as well, but you know, it's, so Hart's line is always precariously uh, on the edge of bankruptcy, okay? But yet it provides access to interior Florida um, on his, you know, he's got this major boat. This is the major boat in the 1870s. It's called the Okahumkey and um, built specifically for use on the Ocklawaha because it's narrow. It's got low smokestacks because the river is so, um, is so twisty and turny. Um, it's got a paddle wheel that's encased inside in the back so it doesn't get caught on the snags and, you know, brings people down the river to see this beautiful river, but also to see what's at the end of this river 
from its tributary, which is Silver Springs. And this is what the boat looks like. You can see the paddle wheel encased here. You can see how narrow it is. Um, and if you go to the, the Museum of History uh, at, at the State Museum in Florida, they have a, a great um, scale, not a scale model, but an actual model of the boat. You can go climb aboard it. You can see the state rooms. It's pretty amazing. Um, this is the Okahumpke again. This is from a promotional poster here. Um, you know, ecotourism, thousands of, of um, alligators, but 1870s ecotourism, see the alligators, shoot the alligators. Um, and here's his schedule, overnight from Palatka, so it's down the river, these, river, these boats don't go all, all the way up the St. John's, they go to Palatka. People connect to those boats along the St. John's from Jacksonville, either by rail or especially by um, steamboat from there. So it's overnight, overnight. Here it is cruising down the river on the Okawaha. Night. This is a later, one of his later ships, the Hiawatha, assuming that all Indians have kind of northern names, you know, the Hiawatha has absolutely nothing to do with Florida, but there we have it anyway. This is like 1900, and the illuminated Okawaha Forest, one of the things that they do is at night, they travel along there and um, illuminate uh, cauldrons of pitch pine, which illuminates the forest, and, and people like Harriet Beecher Stowe see it as a fairyland, okay? There it is again, you can see the, the um, paddle wheel enclosed in the back. Um, and one of the things that they do, it's not just, I mean, as an entrepreneur, he's making money off tourists, but he's also using these boats as avenues of commerce. So up and down the Oklawaha, small landings, um, most of which today are, are just uh, rotting pilings and, and places on, on old maps um, in which people from uh, the surrounding area can bring their crops to be taken to market and can also purchase the things necessary to survive just above subsistence. So all along this river, his boats are bringing the market to people like the Baxters and taking their products, their, their um, excess products, to the market as well, okay? Um, same thing here, again, along the edge of the Okawa. And these are, this is a turpentine mill um, still here at the edge of the Okawaha in which uh, people in the forest are uh, making turpentine and uh, then selling it and bring it out to market on the boats of the Okawaha. And the key place where people go is Silver Springs. Okay, Florida Springs, even in the 1870s, are considered to be this ethereal, wonderful place, this wonderland that you know, people, again, in the Northeast, wealthy Northern tourists, don't ever come to. So these boats ply the Oklahoma and end up at Silver Springs. Okay? Uh, the glass bottom boat is invented by someone in Silver Springs in the 1870s. Um, so people get off the, the steamer, uh, go around the glass bottom boat, and then come back on. Here we have, again, this is Heartline, Silver Springs. Silver Springs again, the steamboat there. And while the Oklawaha is mainly designed for tourism, the St. John's is designed much more for commerce. This is the major entrepreneur of the St. John's River, Captain Jacob Brock, who coincidentally also comes from Vermont, and coincidentally also comes to Florida before the Civil War, and coincidentally also, fights on the side of the Confederacy, and after the Civil War reinvents himself as a supporter of the federal government. Now, this is his boat, the Darlington, which is a blockade runner, uh, originally used as a ship along the St. John's during the, during the 1850s, captured, and as a blockade runner, okay? You can see, captured in Fernandina Beach. By the 1870s, you can see the ships on the St. John's much larger. We have side wheelers, and they connect to um, larger docks in, um, in Jacksonville, which connect to steamboat lines from New York, Boston, all the way down, you can see, leapfrogging the Atlantic, all the way down, New York, Baltimore, Savannah, Charleston, Savannah, all the way down to Jacksonville. Okay. And Jacksonville becomes the leading Florida port in the 1870s because of its connection to the St. John's River, as opposed to Fernandina, which really doesn't have any connections. Okay, Fernandina is connected to the St. Mary's, which we all know goes to Georgia, which we all know doesn't mean anything. Okay. <laughs> um, this is the first place that steamboats on the, on the St. John's would stop. Anybody know what this is? 
This is Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her and her husband come down here. They buy land in the 1860s. In 1872, she publishes her, her book on Florida called Palmetto Leaves, which is a really amazingly insightful look at what Florida is in the 1870s. Um, it's flora, it's fauna, it's relationship to the freedmen, um, and it's, you know, it, it really gives a good insight into a different world of Florida, a very different world than the Baxters live in. This is the next place that will be down here. This is Green Cove Springs along the St. John's and opening up the possibility for, for uh, northern invalids, as it were, okay, who come down here. And um, the water is drank exclusively by everybody in the vicinity and its efficacy for diseases of the skin and the blood is unsurpassed. So, you know, people are coming down here taking these boats along the St. John's for the waters to get better. And certainly, you know, that ties in with what happens a decade later when who comes down here to get better but um, Henry Flagler and his wife. So this is the major reason at some level why the, the St. John's is so important for our story. These are country stores, country stores which grow up along the river, which have a long history in the river. You know, the major store in the area along the St. John's where the Baxters would have been is in Volusia and Astor which really start um, with Indian trails uh, during the Spanish and British periods earlier on. Um, Astor is named after, interestingly enough, the Astors uh, from New York, uh, who bought their land from Moses Levy. You know, so it's, it's a long history of, of things. And, and um, the Baxters would come to places like this to trade and to make things necessary, to get the things necessary to make their life just a little above that hard scrabble existence. This is a packing house. This is a place where locals would go to uh, bring their citrus to be traded on the steamboats back up north, okay? So connections again, connections again. This is the Astor House in an area very close to where the Baxters would have lived. The Astors build this hotel again, telling us of how interestingly people live next to each other a hotel for northern tourists and sportsmen, right next to the, the country store in which people like the Baxters would have traded their excess, their surplus goods for the things necessary for them to survive. Um, Brock builds this huge hotel down further south as early as the 1850s. Um, this is in Enterprise, which is on the north shore of Lake Monroe, which is not really a lake, as we've said. Um, and you know, as you can see, this huge, wooden structure, very different from the subsistence agricultural existence of the Baxters. Okay. This is a boat from the line that Brock establishes called the DeBerry, named after another northern interloper, Frederick DeBerry, who comes to Florida in the 1870s and builds DeBerry Hall, again, on the north shore of Lake Monroe, this huge 5,000 acre estate with this amazing manor house. Uh, he's from Europe, even though he's from, from the north, he, you know, he emigrated to the north, born in Europe, and attempting to recapitulate kind of a northern feudal existence here. Again, juxtaposing in the early 1870s what life would be like for the Baxters, okay? Um, by the end of that decade, the northern area of, of Lake Monroe has been superseded by the southern area of Lake Monroe. This is Sanford on the south shore, named after Henry Sanford, another northerner who comes down here in the post-war era. Huge boats. You can see um, the size of the steamships increasing as the, decades, uh, as the decades go by. These are huge boats on the St. John's, designed for passenger traffic, but also for the commerce that is going to open up Florida to the market. Okay? By the 1880s, Brock has sold out to the Clyde Line, which is part of an international conglomerate of steamship lines. You know, um, Boston, Providence, all the way there, but also even to uh, the Caribbean as well. There it is, the Clyde Line again. By the 1880s, the major one, you can see how large these ships are. And in the 1880s, uh, the, the, the wharf in Jacksonville is moved to accommodate landings associated with the railroad. And, you know, here it is, Boston Division, St. John's River, West India Division, all the way, consolidated steamship lines. Again, as we see, you know, very typical of what's happening in America in the late 19th century, consolidation, uh, conglomerates, companies increasing in size. This is their headquarters in, in downtown Jacksonville on Bay Street. 
And what that leads to is, what that leads to is um, commercial agriculture, okay? People growing for the market rather than the Baxters just growing for themselves. You know, Baxters grow for themselves, but they have surplus, they bring it. The, the railroad and the steamships allow for people to grow strictly for the market. And by the 1890s, you know, Florida has changed. The railroad, this is the plant line accessing into the central part of the state. This is the East Coast Railroad allowing penetration all the way by 1912 to Key West. And again, opening Florida to a very different kind of life than the Baxters live. Um, and you know, this represents this transition point as the large steamer on the St. Johns River represents the kind of, of living together of the subsistence life of the, of the Baxters with the penetration of the market as represented by people like Hart and Brock and DeBerry. So with that kind of, of juxtaposition, I will end. Thank you. Thanks. Well, as we uh, said this morning, if you have questions for Stephen Noel, we'll be, uh, after our next two presenters, presenters we'll be doing uh, all of the questions and comments at, at once at the end. Uh, next, though, our next speaker is Paul Ortiz. And Paul Ortiz serves as director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and associate professor of history at the University of Florida. Uh, the Proctor Program was the recipient of the 2013 Oral History Association's Stetson Kennedy Vox Populi Award in recognition of the program's commitment to social justice scholarship. His books include Emancipation Betrayed, The Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida from Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920. He has written essays and articles and is currently finishing The Glorious Advocates of Liberty, Black Internationalism and the Politics of Emancipation, which will be published in the forthcoming book, The Shadow of Slavery, Emancipation, Memory, and the Meaning of Freedom, edited by William Link and James Brumall. Uh, please welcome Paul Ortiz. Thank you, Ben. PowerPoint set up. And uh, first, uh, I want to start by thanking Flo Turcott and the libraries for inviting me. And um, it's a real honor to be here, to be with such distinguished uh, colleagues as Steve Noel, Dave Ben, uh, colleagues in the library. Um, and I'd like to begin by really just thanking the organizers. Actually, let's give Flo a round of applause. Um, <laughs> I know other people were involved in this, but Flo was the one that wrote me in. So for me, she's been the face of the, of the, of the Yearling Symposium. This is a magnificent book, and I'd just like to, to have us pause for a moment and just think about the book. How many of us have read the Yearling, uh, or reread the Yearling, uh, maybe in the last year or two? Um, out of those folks, how many of you had already read this novel? Many of us. And there's a reason for that. This is one of the most magnificent novels in American history. Now, I teach literature. It's kind of one of my sidelights. And I was just down in the villages not too long ago. And I was teaching uh, workshops on uh, Faulkner. And I had my students who were all in their, you know, a lot of late, mid, late 70s, 80s, and older uh, read Intruder in the Dust. And we went through other Faulknerian novels. Any of my graduate students, or any graduate student that comes to me to learn and says, I want to do a field on Southern history, knows my response. I tell them to read three Faulkner novels. I pick the novels, and I say, come back to me after you finish that, and then we'll talk about doing a field on Southern history. And Nicole Cox, I can see you smiling as one of those students. Um, I, and, and I, I mention this because I place the yearling uh, in that great high rung of American literature. This is not just a coming of age novel. Um, it is that, but it is so much more. It is a novel that raises the most profound questions in the human condition. And it speaks to the, the topic of, and the themes of what I'm gonna touch upon briefly uh, this afternoon. If you think of the questions that this novel raises, I just started scrawling a few down. What is happiness? Uh, what is the purpose 
of life. And uh, those of you that study Greek philosophy know that uh, in their conception, those two questions were, were exactly the same questions. Uh, what is the relationship between the individual and the society? Uh, these are implicit questions that are woven like very powerful threads throughout the entire novel. The time period of the yearling, and now I want us to kind of get back into that world of the late antebellum South, the Civil War. I want us to ask some questions and think aloud about these questions. What was the impact of the Civil War on this narrative? We know Penny Baxter was uh, a Civil War combat veteran. What kinds of experiences would he have had in the Civil War that impact his relationship to the broader society? In Rawlings' conception of politics, and usually when people talk about the yearling, they don't talk about politics, but I want to talk about politics today. I would argue that the book is suffused with politics all throughout, and this is the first hint uh, uh, about a political conception of what's happening in Florida. And simply to echo my colleague, Steve Knoll, this is a world of tremendous ferment. If you moved to Florida, if you were black, white, Hispanic, Bahamian, uh, if you were from South America, if you moved to Florida in the 1870s to get away from the political ferments sweeping the Americas, Florida was the wrong place to go because Florida was in the center, as, as my colleague Flo can tell you, of all of those ferments, all of those controversies. All of the struggles over the relationship of things like technology, of commerce, uh, just to, to echo what Dr. Knoll was saying. And Marjorie Rollins, in her work, and not just in The Yearling, poses a series of questions to us about change in society. And you see in this passage, she doesn't necessarily think that all of these changes are good. This is not a progressive conception of history where things are getting better and better and better as time wears on. As my colleague Dr. Lester can tell you, some people gain access to the land, many others lose access to the land. Uh, some do fairly well, um, others are ruined, wiped out, homeless, have to leave. Um, so the time period that the yearling is set in, I would argue, and I'm just gonna be provocative here, is the most important period of politics in Florida history. It, it's a time of tremendous uh, political upheaval, interracial politics and struggle, reconstruction. What role does reconstruction play in the novel? The novel is set in reconstruction. Again, there are hints kind of suffused throughout, throughout the book. But the world that Penny Baxter and his family and, and their peers create in the 1870s and 1880s is the world that Zora Neale Hurston is born into. It's the world that Stetson Kennedy is born into. Um, it's the world that Jose Marti encounters when he comes to Florida in the early 1880s. Uh, it's the world that James Weldon Johnson is born into. So this is what I mean by, by this, is, this is a critical era. In many ways, it's still the world that we are born into. Now, I've, I've made the statement that I want us to think about the people of the yearling, the characters, the, the communities, for a moment just in political terms. Penny Baxter doesn't just work. He doesn't just raise a family. He isn't just a husband. He would have thought about politics. How could he have avoided thinking about politics? This is Florida. This is Reconstruction. Uh, this is a time of, of tremendous change. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about a political party that people like Penny Baxter uh, and others organized in the 1880s. Uh, this is one of the most important political parties in American history. It was an experiment in interracial politics, and it was one of the first of its kind. It was called the Independent Party of Florida. Uh, it has been all but forgotten uh, uh, not necessarily by historians. Florida historians like Dr. Knoll, uh, Dr. Davis, and Dr. Lester talk about the Independent Party, but when I talk about it in my classes to students who are increasingly born in Florida, they know next to nothing about it. And one question I have is why? Why have we forgotten this remarkable experiment in interracial coalition 
building. Now, I just finished an essay on William Watson Davis, who wrote a book called The Civil War and Reconstruction in Florida. And this is the first full-length essay that tries to grapple with the legacy of that astonishing book. Uh, it's, it's almost 800 pages long. Uh, John David Smith uh, convinced me to read the book for the third time. If you know John David, you realize that he's very convincing. Um, but John David was putting together a book on the Dunning School of Reconstruction and Civil War Studies. And if you know about the Dunning School, you know that they had a particular interpretation of American history in the 1870s during Reconstruction. And their conception overall was that the enfranchisement of African Americans had been a tragic error, and that white people suffered, that black people suffered. It was an era of tremendous corruption. Um, and actually, my Florida students still know that story. If they know anything about Reconstruction, they know what the term carpetbagger is. Now, fewer of them know what the term scalawag is, or was, right? Uh, but it's amazing to me how Davis's thesis continues to resonate somehow. Um, I've, I've talked to high school teachers, and they say, well, I don't teach that. But somehow it continues to resonate and percolate in the society. This idea implicit behind it that disenfranchisement was a good thing. And I think this goes to the core of why we are having problems today in the society about settling on this question of who has the right to vote or who should vote and how easy do we make the right to vote. Now let me turn back to, to the world of Florida. And I learned a lot about Florida. Uh, well, I've been learning a lot from my wife who's a native uh, Floridian. Uh, Sheila was actually the rodeo queen of Homestead, Florida in 1970. So she taught me a lot about the state uh, but I learned a lot about it as a graduate student doing research, my dissertation, Ben mentioned the book Emancipation Betrayed, was based on that dissertation research. The, the book I wrote was, or the, the dissertation, was really on African American political struggles in Florida from about Reconstruction to the Great Depression. But C. Van Woodward is talking here in this particular passage in Origins of the New South about why is it that so many small southern farmers are living hard scrabble lives? And this is a whole section. We, we talk about living in the scrubs, how difficult it was. But the question that I have is why do people live in the scrubs? Now, Rawlings's de or interpretation, her analysis in that previous passage suggests tensions in the society. It isn't just that Penny Baxter wants to raise his family in a kind of independent way. Um, is that there are a lot of political and economic tensions happening on the mainland. But this is another tension. It's that big people are coming in and buying up big chunks of land. Uh, Dr. Lester is much more of an authority on this than I am, but Dr. Noel mentioned a 5,000 acre estate. Now, that's really something. That's a lot of land. Uh, that was a lot of land back then. I think it's a lot of land right now. Uh, but think about if you have people that have 5,000 acre estates, if you have people that own 10,000 acres of land or even 500,000 acres of land, that is precluding other people from being on the same land. And those conflicts over land are driving the political ferment in Florida in the 1880s and the political ferment which is going to lead to the largest third party movement in American history, which is what? The People's Party, the Texas Farmers Alliance. Farmers Alliance is very active um, in, in, in Florida. I won't get into that, but here, I just want us to think about land. This was a joke in American political culture. Florida, early on, was, was known for corruption. Uh, unfortunately, um, Dr. Chalmers, I think we, we still are. Uh, we, we're, we're still seen as being one of the most corrupt uh, states in the union. There's, there's actually indicators for corruption, by the way. But anyway, this idea that you can have a public domain of so much acreage, but then the state legislature could sell off well above that domain. And Woodward wanted to get us to think about political corruption in the 1880s after the fall of the black uh, and white coalition governments. The carpetbaggers in all their glory could hardly match such deeds. So who governs 
in the world of the yearling. Who are the people running the society? Uh, who are the people uh, opening up the state for trade? Who are the people deciding who lives where, you know, in charge of, of, of zoning as it existed, uh, in charge of laying out uh, towns, uh, metropolises, uh, building cities like Gainesville? There was a certain view of, of politics and leadership in this era, and in this case, I didn't attribute the quote, but this again is C. Van Woodward, Origins of the New South. The people that run the society, and of course there are political differences, political tensions, but the people that we know or that were known then as the Bourbon Democrats or kind of the elite Democrats um, talk about the rule of the taxpayer. They talked much more bluntly than politicians talk today in many ways about class conflict, class cleavages, uh, this notion that you're if you're a small farmer, or if you don't own your land, or you're a tenant, or you're a sharecropper, you have no business voting. You have no business in politics. Politicians are much, the, the, the Bourbon Democrats are much blunter uh, in the 1870s and 1880s than the political parties are now. Uh, but they were very clear, and Woodward, again, wanted us to understand that the Bourbon democracy tendency was, was very much geared towards bringing in northern capital, bringing in northern investment, uh, and essentially giving away large chunks of the public domain. But you can only do that if you usher in disenfranchisement, because a lot of people are going to disagree with those types of public policies of giving land away, right? Now, the world of the yearling is a world in which people are trying to you know, eke out an existence, trying to, 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 to care for each other, to love each other. Penny Baxter has this desperate, you, you can feel his heart, what he's trying to do for his, his, his child, the children that, that they have lost, that he and his wife have lost, the lack of resources. If you have a chance to kind of retrace uh, Marjorie Rawlings's footsteps, and you ever come across a small cemetery in one of these towns that used to exist and no longer exists, you will understand the depths of tragedy. Uh, and see some people shaking their head, row after row. And remember, Penny Baxter, in, in early in the novel, talks about taking a penknife and carving the name of yet another deceased child. And today, these cemeteries tell a sad tale. Row after row, little Joe, age two and a half, died of tick fever. Uh, Sally, attacked by a bear. Uh, another child, uh, tick fever was often used as the cause of death. I'm not a medical historian, but I think in many cases, uh, tick fever was probably over attributed. Uh, it was a major factor uh, in disease and death. Uh, but it's, it's it, but again, you see row after row of this in these cemeteries. This is a hard scrabble life, but let's ask ourselves why that is. Did it have to be that way? People in Penny Baxter gener generation would say, no, we can create a different kind of political system, a more democratic political system, where the world can be fairer, where not everyone has to live that hard scrabble life. That was the core of the Independent Party platform. Um, which I'll get to in just a second here. But this is a prelude, and this kind of gets to, to the core of what I wanted to say about black and white interracial coalition politics. African Americans are not prominent in the yearling, but they're there. There's a little couplet or a little poem uh, that one of the characters uh, cites during, during, during the course of the novel. I won't get into that. But this was a prelude, and I talked about this in my essay on William Watson Davis, and this is something that, again, has been completely almost erased from popular understanding of Reconstruction era Florida politics, not just in Florida, but in the other states, because every state had a moment of interracial promise where black and white and sometimes Hispanic people got together and began to organize, meaning to think about what's our common interest, you know, if, if, if I'm in the Baxter family and I'm struggling to make ends meet and I look across the way and there's a black uh, small farming family, the way that Dr. Knoll was talking about, maybe 
color of our skin isn't the most important factor uh, of our lives. Uh, maybe our enemy is not each other. Uh, maybe it's the railroad coming in and taking all this good land that's being given to them by the state, not just in Florida, but in Georgia and Alabama, all the way to California. I would connect this to the world of Sinclair Lewis, the octopus. The impact that the railroads have in California is no different on politics and governance and social life than the impact that politics or that railroads have um, on, on Florida. We often talk about railroads in terms of development, but again, let's think about what kind of development is happening. Um, here, John Wyatt, uh, who is an African-American representative, this is in the heart of Reconstruction. I, I hate to read PowerPoints, you know that by now, I, I just don't like to read them. You can read, the, read it for yourself. The delegation in Leon County was an all-black delegation. This is in the, in the heart of Reconstruction. There was a bill that had been uh, brought forward by the Bourbons, which would allow corporations to consolidate and to, to uh, uh, expedite the, the charter process. And a coalition of African Americans came forward and said, no, we don't want corporations to have more power in Florida. Why not? Well, we know what happens when you give corporations a lot of power because we know what happens to Pennsylvania. We know Tammany Hall in New York. So why would we want to bring Tom Scott, Jim Fisk, or Vanderbilt into Florida and do the same thing to us that they've already done in ruining politics in Pennsylvania and New York? And you know the interesting thing about this, and I wrote this in my essay on, um, on Davis, is that after Representative Wyatt gave this speech, white Democrats approached him and patted him on the back and congratulated him. And they said, finally, someone has the moxie to come out in the open and say this. It's still relatively early on in Reconstruction. And there's a basis here for an interracial alliance, an interracial coalition, a, a true kind of party system where you actually had competition, where the conception of politics wasn't the party of white supremacy. Now, we know that. We know the outcome. We know that the Democrats are the, become the party of white supremacy um, and that the Republicans fall into disrepair and all that. But I'm trying to get us to think about these possibilities, that this world that we've forgotten that we should remember. Because I would argue that the world that we've forgotten uh, gives us, you know, th there's a tragedy in there because we know that this viewpoint doesn't win out, even in the sense of, 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 of being able to compete with other viewpoints. But there's also a possibility in there. If African Americans and white people could talk coalition politics in the 1870s, um, it can happen at any time. So there are two visions of, of politics during Reconstruction and in the fateful election of 1884, which, which Penny Baxter would have would have participated, would have voted in at least, would have heard stump speeches. Politics were very different uh, in this time period. You, each candidate visited uh, the city, took those steamboats that Dr. Knoll was showing us, took the, took the trains, uh, stage coaches, any uh, horses, mules. And Richard Call Long was Florida political royalty. Uh, many of his relatives had been uh, had been or would become legislators, former, one former governor, um, and he is selling a conception of politics and labor. Again, think of the term hard scrabble labor. And his argument here in 1884 is that we need to bring in disenfranchisement in order to crush labor to lower wages. And he says, look at Georgia and Alabama. Uh, they've already done this, but we can only do this if we can call a constitutional convention and eliminate black people as a factor of politics in this state. Those of you that know Florida history know that the tragedy is even broader than disenfranchisement. The tragedy is that when that convention is called, a whole raft of measures are passed by the constitutional convention to not only disenfranchise African Americans, but to make it progressively harder for white Floridians to get involved in politics, to run for office. Much more, it becomes much more difficult with that 1885 Constitution to vote 
residency requirements, uh, ushering in eventually of, of uh, in fact, the poll tax. But here is the, the vision that we say now too often, I think, well, that's just the way things were back then. People were racist back then or more racist back then, and, and that's just the way things were. But again, I want us to think about the fact that not everyone had this viewpoint. This is the viewpoint that wins, but there are other viewpoints as well. And I just want to share with you in the, in, the, in the few minutes that I have remaining what that other vision was in the time of the yearling. Um, we need books about the Independent Party. Uh, we have a dissertation right now um, and I cover it a bit in Emancipation Betrayed in a chapter, but it needs its own, uh, it's still looking for its own uh, monograph. Uh, public program, uh, that's a hint by the way, um, and a series of events, because again, it's, it's a, it was a remarkable experiment in interracial coalition politics, and uh, Melanie Barr can tell you that a lot of that history is rooted in Gainesville, because it was in 1884, that this emergency conference of colored men, as it was known in the parlance of the time, was called in Gainesville. And the idea among African-American political uh, organizers was this is a moment of crisis. Uh, we're being shot down at the polls, we're being disenfranchised, our educational system is crumbling, um, and we need to do something to get together. Uh, so these discussions about forming an interracial political party with dissident white folks who already see that the party of white supremacy is not giving them what they thought they would get, right? And so they're beginning to mobilize Gainesville as a center of interracial uh, independent party politics. The gubernatorial candidate, by the way, for the independent party was a Confederate war hero, Frank Pope. But African Americans said, African American leaders said, we have to meet these guys halfway. We're going to have to, to just live with the fact uh, Frank Pope may not be the person we would have nominated for, for governor, but we think he's got a fighting chance. So let's support him. You can see the plank. I'm not going to read it for you. But again, think of the world of the yearling. Think of all of these small farmers living hard scrabble lives. This was a political party that was for them. It wasn't for the big Tom Scotts, Jim Fisk's, Vanderbilt's. This was a party for small farmers. And this is why it was able to recruit so many African Americans uh, and a significant number of small white farmers. We're not sure how many, but they're there. And we know this because there was a contested election hearing uh, where people gave testimony after the election. And, taught, and many people who talked about trying to vote but were prevented from voting. Uh, and, when you look at these contested election cases during Reconstruction, in general, the testimony is given by African Americans who were shot, beaten, or brutalized for trying to vote, uh, and they give testimony. In 1884, it's a little different, because now there are white people giving testimony about being shot at, uh, run out of their towns, uh, their businesses shut down uh, if they were small storekeepers or threatened with, with reprisals of some kind or the other. But again, this is a party for people like Penny Baxter. This would have been his political party. Uh, we don't know if he would have, have, have joined. Uh, it may have been too dangerous. You've got those, those wily neighbors, right? Dr. Noel, they, 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 they probably, <laughs> I'm guessing the neighbors may have been <laughs> on the other side. I don't know for sure. Um, but you have here just kind of a, a glimpse of, of, of a different kind of worldview um, that if it would have been put into place, uh, would have led to a much different Florida. The last thought I'll leave you with is that in terms of social and economic and health indicators, by the 1890s and the early 20th century, the health indicators of Florida uh, and Mississippi in terms of infant mortality, um, disease, and many other factors are virtually identical. Uh, and, and Dr. Lester has done research on this. So Florida is more like Mississippi uh, than it is like just about any other state. It didn't have to be that way. Uh, it could have turned out differently. And the world of the yearling, if you think about the, the passion, the love, these are families that are trying to make up for things um, 
that the state should, should be helping them with, that, that things should be, uh, there should be a society where land is more equitably owned. You shouldn't have a society where people can come in and build enormous uh, acreages and estates, and then you have other people who are working as convict labor. And, and I think that's, that's, that's not something that Marjorie Kinder Rollins uh, is, is, is explicit about, but her deep concern and her care for her characters suggests to me, I think, I don't know this for sure, but I think she would have joined the Independent Party. But anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you for your forbearance. Uh, and again, I appreciate the invitation to speak. Well, our, spinal, our final speaker for the afternoon is James Cusick. Uh, James Cusick is curator here at the P.K. Young Library of Florida History. He's president of the Florida Historical Society and is active with other organizations as well, including the Florida Humanities Council and the Gulf South History and Humanities Conference. Uh, Jim is author of the book, The Other War of 1812, The Patriot War and the American Invasion of Spanish East Florida, and co-editor of the book, The Voyages of Ponce de Leon, Scholarly Perspectives with Sherry Johnson. His current research is for a new book called Colonial Crime, Cases from the Records of Spanish East Florida. Please welcome James Cusick. Um, well, thank you all for uh, coming here to the symposium, I uh, would also like to thank my colleague Flo Turcott and our sponsors, the libraries and uh, the Rawlings Society and the Friends of the Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings Farm for sponsoring this. Uh, my session uh, or my presentation uh, it will be kind of a wrap up of a lot of the things that we have been uh, talking about today. And I think you'll find that it, um, it sort of echoes um, many things that the uh, earlier presenters uh, have been saying. So the title of the talk is Eyewitnesses or Eyewitness Accounts of the 1870s, the World of the Yearling, as seen by visitors uh, to Florida. And in contrast to what we heard about uh, this morning when the first two presentations told us about people who lived the life of the Bas Baxters and lived in the big scrub, um, this uh, paper is uh, directed more at people who visited Florida. They didn't live in Florida. They may have spent only a few weeks to a few months here in Florida. And they were usually from the north. Um, and the two things that I want to, uh, to make a point of in the talk is first, that a lot of these people coming from the north, they already had a preconceived idea of what Florida was going to be like before they got here. Uh, and also, when they wrote about Florida, uh, they tended to focus on what was picturesque or exotic or what was different from what they experienced in their lives up north. And so the questions that uh, I want to address are, first of all, why did they have this preconceived notion of Florida? Kind of like today when people think of Florida and they think of golf courses and Disney World and timeshare condos and beaches. It was the same in the 1870s. So why was that? Um, and the second thing I want to look at is uh, um, then uh, what they tended to focus on uh, when they looked, uh, when they came to Florida, and what kind of, uh, uh, how that compares with the world of the yearling that uh, Rawlings told us about. All right, well, for the first question, you know, why did they have preconceived notions? Well, for the one thing, by the 1870s, there were a lot of people writing about Florida, and they were well-known people, and they were writing largely for a northern audience. Uh, here's a good example, uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was in charge of one of the black regiments here in the Civil War, the South Carolina First, uh, goes on uh, to become very well known in academics uh, up in New England. He's a friend of Emily Dickinson. And in 1870, he publishes his work, Army Life in a Black Regiment, which includes many allusions to Florida because his regiment was very active on the St. John's and St. Mary's River. Uh, and just to make the point, just a quick excerpt from his work, uh, down here at the bottom, he's talking about Jacksonville. And what does he have to say about Jacksonville? He says, the wharves were capacious and the blocks of brick warehouses along the street were utterly unlike anything we had seen yet in that region, as were the neatness and thrift everywhere visible. 
It had been built up by Northern Enterprise, and much of the property was owned by loyal men. All right, get the gist of that? Um, the best parts of Florida were the parts that were built by Northern investors. Um, well, Higginson was very well known, but what about somebody that was internationally famous, like Harriet Beecher Stowe? All right, she also, as you heard, came and settled in Florida. In 1873, she publishes Palmetto Leaves, rather an ironic work, uh, because uh, Stowe actually takes to task this whole idea of the picturesque Florida. Again, I'll read just a brief uh, remark from her book. She says, now tourists, northern tourists, and travelers generally uh, come uh, with their heads full of certain romantic ideas of waving palms, orange groves, flowers and fruit all bursting forth in tropical abundance. And in consequence, they go through Florida with disappointment at every step. All right, now the irony of that, of course, is that Stowe herself is probably the one who most creates this tradition of the picturesque. Her book is filled with anecdotes. It's filled with elegies to the Florida countryside. And many people who write later, if you look in the 1880s, things like uh, Petals Plucked from Sunny Climes and other books like that, they model themselves very much on Stowe. So at the same time that she's deriding this, she's also actually kind of one of the, the, the lead authors who perpetuates this idea of Florida being a place of quixotic and picturesque kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, scenes. Another one by Sidney Lanyard, famous poet from Georgia, Florida, its scenery, climate, and history. Um, again, just a short uh, quote from early on in this work. The water turkey, which we know as the Anhinga, is the most preposterous bird with, within the range of ornithology. He says, it is not a bird, it is a neck. Um, good description of an ahinga, but you get the kind of idea of, you know, I mean, this is something that you wouldn't see, you know, up north. Uh, and so he calls attention to it. His book is filled with, you know, kind of little pieces of writing like that. And then finally, also in the 1870s, you get the production of picturesque Florida which comes out as a volume and which also comes out in Appleton's, uh, also directed at a northern audience. Um, uh, filled with these scenes of gigantic plants, plants that are larger than life, uh, and hound dogs and poultry and pelts and, uh, you know, um, wading birds and things. I mean, all these images that, you know, that people begin to have about Florida. All right, well, the three people I'm going to talk to you about are not famous people, or at least they're not as famous, and they're not published writers, um, but they have many things in common at least with Higginson and at least with uh, Stowe and also with Rawlings um, because, for one thing, they're all Yankees. They're all from the North, all right? Uh, there's uh, George Whitwell Parsons, born and raised in Brooklyn. There's Martha D. Allen from Philadelphia. And there's Abraham P. Leach uh, from Jamaica, Long Island, all right? These are the three people I'm going to talk about. Um, they're all well off. Uh, as Steve Knoll and Paul Ortiz reminded us, they're affluent people. They're all well-educated. They would have read these authors that I had just shown you. Um, and they all had a predilection to write. Um, some of them published. Some of them just liked to write. They wrote uh, in journals and diaries. George Wetwell Parsons started writing a diary when he was 22 years old. He was still writing diaries when he was 72 years old. He kept them for uh, the better part of 50 years. Um, all right, so let's see kind of, you know, their attitudes towards Florida and also how those attitudes compare with the world that Rawlings tells us about in The Yearling. Well, here's Parsons later in life. He's actually more famous as one of the founders of Tombstone, Arizona. New York kid, didn't like New York, wanted to get out in the wilds. His first excursion into wildness was Florida, came in 1872, 1873, 1874. Later on, went west. Um, his diaries have been here at the library, his Florida diaries have been here at the library since the 1930s. Uh, all of his diaries ended up in California, where he died. Um, but for some reason, the executor of the estate said that the uh, University of Florida might be interested in his two diaries on Florida that he wrote as a young man, and they sent them here, along with another box that apparently contained a stuffed alligator. Uh, the diaries are still on the shelf, and they're now online. They're online in a, in a project we have called Pioneer Days in Florida. Uh, the alligator, I have not been able to trace the alligator. Uh, I suspect it's over in the Florida Museum of Natural History somewhere, but I've never been able to prove that. 
All right. So uh, he comes down here. He's uh, born in Brooklyn, well-to-do, destined to be an attorney, not interested in law school, decides to come to Florida. His first excursion to Florida is rather dull. He goes to Fernandina and Jacksonville. If you read the entries, he spent most of his time walking on the beach in the company of attractive young women, picking up shells and talking about business at the local shops. And that's all he did for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. It's a bad diary, all right? Goes back to New York, comes back to Florida. Second time, this time he decides, I guess he wants something a little bit more exciting, so he heads for Key West. And there, although it's a very different environment from this big scrub environment we've been talking about, he definitely encounters a world more like the world that the Baxters are used to as he goes through the Keys and uh, to Biscayne uh, Bay and into the Everglades. So here's uh, an example of, uh, on one of the Keys, Pine Key. He says, near our anchorage was a small settlement of Bahamians, or Conks as they are called. They are English and intermarry and are people by themselves. Uh, and then he goes on to say, we tried for some snipe last night but failed. Food is rather bad, half cooked bread and bacon. I am astonished that Ross hangs on as well as he does. He seems to be able to eat the food and not suffer from indigestion, right? So, um, so he's down there in this world of wreckers and turtlers, uh, very diverse. There's Cuban fishermen down there. There's you know, white and black residents. Um, very different from what he had seen up in Jacksonville. Um, instead of uh, walking with young ladies on the beach, Every beach he goes to down there, the same story. And here's one of them. He says, spent the worst night of my whole existence, I believe, last night. The mosquitoes were something I had never imagined them to be. Um, and he goes on to say, while walking, I heard a noise of machinery in motion, something like a sawmill or something like that. He said, startled, I stood for a moment and listened, but only for a moment uh, did I stand, and then I ran. The noise was explained by a cloud of mosquitoes that had discovered me and were coming for me. I legged it, and they after me, I was not quite devoured, right? Every time they put ashore, this is what they're greeted with. A lot of you will remember Patrick Smith's uh, famous scene in A Land Remembered, where the mosquitoes descend on the herd of cattle, and the cattle are killed, uh, suffocated, smothered under the mosquitoes. Well, I mean, this was something that, uh, that is well documented in, uh, in these diaries by, uh, uh, by this fellow from New York, all right? And finally, he also goes bear hunting on the beach. Now, why is he bear hunting on the beach? Well, because it's turtle season. It's sea turtle nesting season. And the bears are going out to the beach to dig up the nest to eat the eggs. And so the hunters who want the bears are also going out to get the eggs, um, but are going out also to catch the bears whenever they can find them. Uh, and he says, the turtle will lay from one to 200 eggs at one <clears throat> lay, so old Bruin had a rare feast. So old Slewfoot, if he had lived down by the North River or Biscayne Bay, would not have had to, you know, kill people's sows. He could have gone out and had quite a feast for himself, uh, you know, out on the beach during turtling season, all right? Um, let's turn to a slightly different account, one that's much nearer to home uh, in terms of the yearling. And that's the impressions of Martha D. House, who comes from Bering Street, Philadelphia in 1874 and travels in Florida with her, her husband, Charles. Now, these are pictures of them probably about the time of their marriage when they're in their 20s, in the 1850s. They were much older when they visited Florida, probably in their mid-40s, all right? Uh, but what do they decide to do? Well, you've already heard, actually, what they decide to do. They go on the Okahunky, up the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma River, all right? This is the popular thing to do at the time. And <clears throat> Martha, Miss Allen, writes an account, kind of a log, of their trip. Uh, she doesn't use any proper names in it. Everybody in the book is named, as she names herself the scribe because she's writing it. There's the professor. There's the general, sounds kind of like Gilligan's Island. Um, there's someone called Seven Eights. I've never figured out what Seven Eights is, but I think it's a young girl. And I think she's Seven Eights because she's a teenager, so she's only Seven Eights of an adult. She's not quite an adult yet, uh, but she figures in it. And in this log, um, Martha Allen talks about all the things that, uh, that you've heard about uh, from Steve Knoll uh, 
She's fascinated by the turns and the windings of the Oklawaha. They go on the pine uh, torch uh, trips at night uh, where you know, it's described as being you know, like a fairyland. Uh, she's fascinated with the wildlife, with the waterfowl. Uh, she notes that there are people on board up on the upper deck who are shooting the alligators, and she complains the gunners are a bothersome set of fellows, crack whacking at the animals, not often to their damage, but making the alligators scoot uh, before we can see them. All right? Um, so, you know, a lot of this stuff uh, is very similar to what you would read uh, in Palmetto Leaves or in other, in other books that would come out in the 1880s. Of great interest, at the beginning of the trip, someone is sitting in the front of the boat, the bow of the boat, and they're reading from a book out loud to an audience. And what are they reading? They're reading palmetto leaves. Brand new, right? It's only been out a year, 1873, 1874. And later on, there are passengers who are flipping through a book of prints uh, that they're looking at. And what are they looking at? They're looking at picturesque America, the same thing that I showed you before. So here are these people who are down here looking at Florida. Florida's right in front of them. They're watching Florida. And what's their reference for Florida? It's these books that are written by guides for northern audiences, which they have obviously brought down with them. Um, another interesting kind of interplay with wildlife, probably the best quote in the whole thing, is she goes ashore to get souvenirs. And here's her comments on souvenirs. She says, most temptations cost more than 25 cents. Scribe, that's her, thought she would like the simple and unadorned tooth of an alligator, but the price was $2. It's a lot of money in 1870. For one of the size of her thumb. A fine wing of the pink curlew cost $2.50, and a duck without stuffing two dollars, all right? The pink curlew was the roseate spoonbill. And so I've included a roseate spoonbill, and you can see his attitude about the idea of losing one of his wings for two dollars and fifty cents, right? But this is what was for sale, you know, in Silver Springs and Palatka. This is, you know, and in Jacksonville, this was very common uh, for these types of souvenirs to be available. All right, let's go to a third person who spends even more time in the Palatka area, now very close to the Big Scrub area, right? The port city, basically, for the Big Scrub. And this is Abraham Paul Leach from Jamaica, Long Island. He's down in Florida. Why is he here? Well, his older son has respiratory illness, and so he's brought him down hoping that it will cure his health. Uh, but he's left at home his wife and his 10-year-old boy. And he feels guilty about being down here because of his 10-year-old at home. So he's constantly writing letters to his 10-year-old and sending him little pictures, little watercolors and sketches that he's making of the life that he sees around him, all right? He's particularly fascinated with cracker culture. Now, he's not part of cracker culture like we heard this morning. For him, crackers are part of the stage setting of Florida, right? They're part of the things that you come to see in Florida. And so here he has a sketch of one cracker gentleman whose nooster caught a fox that he saw one day. Other people that he's just labeled that, uh, that uh, procession there is into town. This is people that are coming into town to sell their wares or to pick up their supplies. And here atop he has a, you know, what he's calling a typical cracker gentleman that he sees in the Palatka area. All right? But not only the people uh, and their lifestyles are of interest to him, uh, he's also interested in sort of what there is to eat. And so here's where he stayed in Palatka. He stayed at Palatka House, appropriately enough. And here's a sketch of the house that he sends home to show his wife and his younger son where they are. And then he copies out the menu. And since we've just eaten lunch, we'll have a look at the menu here and see what we could have had at Palatka House. Well, we could have had fried squirrel. Um, now, I don't especially care for squirrel, but I think if I were going to be forced to eat squirrel, I would prefer it fried. Um, there's hash. There's turnips, tomatoes, cabbage, onions. Those are, that's practically all the vegetables there are on the menu. There's bread pudding. There's apple pudding. There's rice pudding. No problem with carbs at this place, all right? Hominy cakes, macaroni pudding, something very similar to what we had for lunch today. Sweetened cut oranges, which would have been a, a, something of a delicacy. Interestingly enough, he puts in filtered water. Apparently, Yankees did not like this sulfur-smelling water that you could get in Florida, so they wanted it purified in some way, all right? But many of these things are probably things 
that the Baxters would have been familiar with, that you would see, certainly the hominy was, probably the puddings were, if they could get the ingredients, maybe the fried squirrel, I don't know, maybe if, you were, if, you, if, you, if your hunting day went bad on you and you couldn't get wild turkey or venison, then you were down to squirrel. And again, much like other visitors, they're fascinated with the wildlife of Florida. He's constantly sketching, you know, these little uh, critters. He's got, you know, the Florida chameleon. He's got wading birds. He's got wild boar. He has a story about a, a red fox, you know, that he's sketching for his son. He sends all of these things home. Now, other things that really kind of evoke the world of the yearling Ari tells his son, his young son, about the hunters, the hunting dogs that they have. He has a trio of them, and he sketches them. Here they are, Nello, Katie, and Sancho. Uh, he does have to write with disappointment uh, that Sancho dies um, during uh, their trip because uh, from overexhaustion chasing rabbits. He apparently overextended himself. Might have been an older dog, all right? Um, so he likes telling these kind of colorful little tales of uh, what's going on in Florida. And another one that he tells, again, reminiscent maybe of experiences uh, in the yearling, are these two critters, possibly Slewfoot's, you know, two cousins. And he tells his son, his son this wonderful story about these black bears who come in and they steal from the sheep herd and they throw the sheep over their shoulders basically and make off with them for their evening meal, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so again, you know, this whole idea of Florida as a picturesque place, uh, as a place, you know, exotic and different from the world that Northerners know, um, is very much carried out. And remember, these are private writings. Uh, I doubt whether any of these were ever intended for publication, although Leach did run a newspaper for a while up in Jamaica, Long Island, and, and some of these may have been intended eventually, uh, you know, as little anecdotes that he was gonna tell in the newspaper. Other anecdotes? Steamboats again, right? Tells uh, there's an incident while he's in Palatka of someone falling off a steamboat and drowning. Um, and uh, that one is not the Okahumki, that's the Oklawaha. Uh, but he tells a long story about this unfortunate man who falls off the steamboat and they're not able to recover his body and uh, he's presumed drowned. Uh, in another case, he tells a story in verse, an actual poem, uh, about a lodger who decides to play a prank and puts an alligator in his room uh, to scare his roommate. But unfortunately, it's not his roommate, it's his landlady who goes up the steps and releases the alligator. And the alligator uh, comes roaring out of her and she falls down the steps, okay? Um, again, these are, you know, these are little incidents, uh, one of them probably taken from life. Uh, the steamboat one, the other one probably just made up. Uh, he draws a lot of alligators in the course of his trip. Um, but there's this fascination with what I would say is the grotesque or the outre, right? Things that are out of the ordinary. Um, all right, so if we look at all these things, uh, and we look at these several examples of what Parsons wrote, of what Allen wrote, uh, of what Leach was writing and sketching, What's the one thing that's clearly missing from them? Well, this is one of my favorite illustrations from Harper's Weekly. This comes out at the end of the Civil War, 1865. Uh, it's called The Great Southern Labor Question. Uh, and here you see probably the stereotypical uh, Southern family, plantation family, uh, on the porch in the, in the shade, the man taking his ease at a newspaper. And here standing is no longer a man who's a slave, but a black man who's free. And notice that he's standing very much in the stance of a soldier in a regiment, just like the black soldiers. If you go and look at Harper's and you look at the engravings of the black soldiers, they stand exactly like this. And he's got not a gun over his shoulder, but a hoe, right? A garden, uh, agricultural implement. And the caption, uh, which you can see coming from the man reading the newspaper, says, uh, you know, quote, my boy, We've toiled and taken care of you long enough. Now you've got to work, all right? And this is Harper's satirical look about what might happen in the South during Reconstruction. This idea that, you know, freedom is one thing, uh, but surviving and economic uh, survival is another. You know, you've got all these people down South now who have been freed from slavery, but they have to make a living. They have to feed their families. All right. So, 
So that begs the question then, you know, what's going on during this period among the non-white population, you know, among the population of the freed slaves? And we know from a recent study, Daniel Weinfeld's The Jackson County War, that parts of Florida, many parts of Florida, were extremely violent during this period of the late 60s and early 1870s. Jackson County, according to one account, uh, had 56 murders of whites and blacks, mostly blacks. Some statistics, some estimates put the number as high as 184 murders between the end of the Civil War in 1865 and 1872. That's seven years, all right? That, you know, that is a very disruptive, lawless, violent, difficult, dangerous type of society, all right? Uh, Alachua County was not quite like that, but there was certainly a violence, there was certainly violence here. There was certainly violence in Putnam County. We know that from studies, we know that from records of the time. What did these northern visitors see of, of this? And what did they write about it? Well, in fact, their, their contact with it was fairly superficial. If we go back for a minute to Martha D. Leach, she does recount various occasions when she met and talked with black residents of Florida. Here's one of them. Uh, one of the party, the boat party, was interested in a conversation with an aged colored woman who had come up the uh, come on the Okahumki and who said she lived six miles back in the country, right, in the big scrub. A mule was there in readiness to carry her home. She seemed delighted to be free, said they could do as they pleased and that they were doing well, that her, co that her children were going to school. She had thought she was too old to learn, but she was so much encouraged by what was said to her that she said she would go home and begin. All right, her encounters are mostly positive ones. She, and, and the occasions when she gets to talk to black residents, some are going off to start farms, some, one is going off to, to be a minister in a church, this woman is going back home, or her children are in school, all right? Um, somewhat different attitude from both Parsons and Leach. Uh, Parsons, I can say, if you go and study his language, you'll find that when he's talking about a black man or woman who's, uh, uh, say, a ship's captain, he will always refer to them as a Negro. But if it's a laborer or a servant or anybody that's in a subservient uh, capacity, he will always use a derogatory term, always. Uh, and his, uh, his, his diary is just, you know, peppered with these remarks. Uh, Leach from New York, not much different, all right? Here's another one of his little um, curiosities, his little quixotic incidents. Maybe not so funny as the one about the bears, right? This one, he's writing to his son, about a black man who's been arrested and is being led off to jail. You can see that the man has his elbows pinioned behind his back and tied up. Uh, he's being led, I think, by the classic, you know, sort of pot-bellied uh, southern lawman there. Uh, there are other uh, black individuals, maybe family members that are accompanying him, and then uh, a couple of uh, people maybe with guns, you know, further back. It's naive, it's innocent, and yet looked at knowing the background of this time period and looking at it from a modern period of uh, a point of view, that's a slightly stressed, tense scene there, a scene of somebody being let off basically in a mob, right? Because we know um, from historical accounts, what the ultimate result of an arrest like that might be. Um, in another case, again, and as an anecdote for his son, he has this image, right, of black men being tied up in bags, basically, to run a sack race down the main street in Palatka for the entertainment of visitors, right? What are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing a very innocent, very naive version of Jim Crow. This is Jim Crow, right? This is debasing of people. Uh, this is demeaning of people. This is putting people uh, in subservient or lower um, statuses. Um, now, not all of his illustrations are like that. I mean, he has many illustrations simply of people at work. Uh, that's a cobbler's shop up in the corner there. These men down here are grinding vanilla leaves. Uh, which have been brought in from the countryside. These are porters, uh, probably working along the wharves where the river boats are. Um, so, uh, so he has a mixture of images here. Uh, but I think the point is that it's a very complex world. 
uh, this world of the 1870s. And even people that are coming as visitors um, are seeing primarily the side that, that's been advertised to them. Uh, but once they're down here, they can't help but see uh, the side that Ken and Rawlings is uh, projecting, the side of uh, you know, hard scrabble, the side of subsistence, uh, the side of racial tension, the, the side of potential violence. Um, so, um, so their version of 1870 has, I think, many repercussions or many uh, sort of reflections in the world that, uh, that uh, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings creates in The Yearling. Um, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, but at the same time, um, this is a view sort of, of outsiders looking at Florida rather than insiders, uh, and outsiders that have been, in a way, prepared before they even get down here for seeing a Florida that has already been depicted to them or for them in a certain way. Um, so I'm going to uh, conclude there, and uh, I guess we'll be moving to um, questions and answers. Thank you. Great. Well, six outstanding presentations. I'm sure you have some questions or comments. Who, would, who has a question for one of our panelists? Ann Pierce, Ben DiBiase, Connie Lester, Steve Knoll, uh, Paul Ortiz, and Jim Cusick. Let's give them one more round of applause collectively. <laughs> any questions for any or all of these folks? Yes. Uh, I have a question for Ann Pierce. Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you told a very, very wonderful passage by Margaret and there was a Another question or comment? Yes. Right, 
Okay. Oh, sure. Um, I wanted to ask about these images uh, that you showed. Are they available online? Are they they're available online. Uh, they're not scanned this particular manuscript, but there's about 62 of them.
it's no surprise that they have the board in that early report. You know, Key West and the Cuban City is not all the same, but Jacksonville. Um, they find a lot of support uh, for what they're trying to do in the future. Another tragedy we often forget, which is that as the more since the Apache uh, kind of work down in the southwest, many of them were actually kidnapped, abducted, and interned actually in St. Augustine. Uh, they were prisoners of war for, for almost 25 years or so. And, was group, I think, um, and there are pictures, there are, there are actual depictions of them in Stockades, not just in St. Augustine, but I think there's another. I, I've learned this at the American Indian Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, I knew about the St. Augustine story of the infirmary there in the 1880s and 1890s, but I didn't know that there were two other pillars that were captured in the infirmary. Okay, slide. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah, okay. We have a question for Ben over here.
Sure. Question for Connie. Other questions? Sure. Any other questions or comments? I want to make a comment. I want to thank um, all of our panelists for bringing together all of these amazing, disparate primary sources um, under this umbrella of the World of the Yearly. Um, we learned a lot about the way Marjorie Rawlings did her research and the primary sources um, 
um, that she consulted while she was doing that. Um, and a little bit, of, I mean, we learned quite a bit about the things that were subtexts in her work, um, uh, implied and references to situations that were less than idyllic. I mean, uh, as in contrasting with um, Harry Beecher Stowe, who somewhat painted a picture that was much more rosy. Uh, and we saw in Jim Cusick's papers how Northerners kind of the seeds of that whole wild and wacky Florida um, were, were um, sown in that period where uh, Northerners were writing back to their families about the, um, about the crackers and about the, the African Americans in, um, in uh, this area of Florida. So um, again, I want to thank the, um, the presenters for wonderful uh, research, a lot of work went into these presentations, and I'm happy to see that um, this um, session is being recorded because we'll be able to share that with researchers in the future who can stand on our shoulders with regard to our research. Um, in that, um, in that, along that vein, um, I'd like to call your attention to a bunch of the Florida Historical Quarterly journals that I left up there where Elaine is sitting, or oh, right next to where Elaine is sitting. Um, and okay, here I am. Now about the teacher too. The, the um, article that I wrote that was referenced earlier in um, Connie's talk or in, yeah, in Ben's talk, the um, the free copies of that the article in that journal. I hope you'll pay attention and look at the Florida Historical um, Society and, and consider becoming a member. They do great work there, and lots of programs like this. I've gone to Kokopo and different places around the state. Not only would like to thank my employer, University of Florida, but also um, the, the society for participating in this, agreeing to participate, and Ben for, for moderating this group, I think. Let's hear it for Ben. I'm sure, I hope that many of you will flock to Coco to take a look at that journal because it's a wonderful resource as well. And of course, there's flyers about the Marjorie Van Wallings um, collection here at the University of Florida. She bequeathed her, her um, papers to us um, before she died, and we are very proud stewards of her legacy. And I'd love to work with you if you wanted further research. Here's something that you want to learn more about um, today. Absolutely um, get with our, our panelists or with me, and we'll connect you with these resources. Thanks again. Before we go, thanks to Flo, of course, for putting this all together.